paraplegic migraine with paralysis, the patient's experience. I'm Zoe Powis, uh, supervisor of uh, clinical genomics research at Ambry Genetics, and we have today Kirsten Blanco who will be, who will be speaking. A few housekeeping items before we begin. As a reminder that some of the emails that you may be receiving may go to your junk mailbox, so please check there and also add us as known senders. If you are attempting to obtain uh, continuing education units for this, it will only happen if you're listening to this in the live session. The attendants will go through to the GoToWebinar link and there will be an evaluation that will pop up at the end of the session. You're required to do that in order to be able to um, get CEUs. If you are um, getting NSGC CEUs, that will happen on a quarterly basis. If you're getting PACE, that will happen one certificate per session and will be available four weeks post session. You must keep track of your own CEUs to make sure that they're correct. When you join this webinar, you are automatically muted, but this, uh, and this session is being recorded. It will be available after this if you wish to listen to it again. You do have a control panel at the right hand of your screen. On that, if you have any questions, you are able to ask them at any time during the session, but they will be answered at the end of the webinar. And um, when you are doing the evaluation at the end of the session, it will not ask for your name as you used it when you logged in today. And to introduce Kirsten, Kirsten Blanco has lived with hemiplegic migraine since adolescence, a rare form of migraine with aura that can present with debilitating neurological symptoms, such as sensory, motor, and cognitive disturbances. Despite numerous obstacles and setbacks and the challenges of diagnosis, treatment, and management, she was fascinated by the puzzle of the human brain and received her bachelor's in neuroscience from the University of California, Los Angeles, with the intent to become a physician. As a patient within the rare disease community, she's been exposed to nearly every aspect of medicine with lengthy diagnostic journey to the importance of compassion in patient-physician interactions. She's currently a clinical research assistant in genetics, working in primarily in neuro neurological and neurodevelopmental disorders, which has encouraged her interest in pediatrics and medicine, medical genetics so she can eventually provide care and be an advocate for children and adolescents struggling with rare conditions. It was with extreme pleasure, I introduce to you Kirsten and have her speak about living with familial hemiplegic migraine paralysis. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kirsten, and today I'm going to talk to you about something that's affected my life for the last 10 years, um, and I'm really looking forward to sharing with you all. So just a disclosure and conflict of interest, um, I am a full-time salaried employee here at Ambry Genetics. And for the learning objectives, the first is to define familial hemiplegic migraine, or FHM, and the associated neurological symptoms. Second, to discuss the genetics and pathophysiology of FHM. And then third, to describe the patient experience of living with this migraine. So what are migraines? Um, I'm sure most of you have heard of a migraine before. Um, it's a neurological condition typically characterized by episodes of severe head pain and debilitating symptoms. And these can include visual disturbances, nausea, vomiting, photophobia, or light sensitivity, and phonophobia, or sound sensitivity. And this is a little comic I found. Um, a headache can kind of feel like a little mosquito bite, but a migraine can feel like a full-blown shark bite. Um, and it's just kind of all-encompassing. Like when these strike, you're really taken out for the majority of the day. And it's actually a very large public health problem, and it's not really recognized as one. Um, it affects approximately 39 million individuals in the U.S., and a lot of times it comes with depression, anxiety, and sleep disturbances. And healthcare and lost productivity costs are estimated to be about 36 billion per year just in the U.S. alone. And this is high medical costs, little support, limited access to quality care. There's only like 500 headache specialists, um, and many of them are mostly concentrated in very large cities. And it's also poorly understood and often undiagnosed and undertreated. And there are different types of migraine. The first is migraine without aura, and this one is the classic migraine that people think of, like the splitting head pain, um, nausea, vomiting, you kind of lock yourself in a dark room for most of the day. And then there's also migraine with aura, which gets a lot more complicated. 25 to 30% of people um, with migraines have this, and it's usually localizable to the cerebral cortex or the brain stem. And the aura is something that occurs before the headache, and it's um, 
It involves neurologic disturbances such as visual, sensory, speech, motor, and other CNS symptoms. And there's actually even subclasses of migraine with aura. There's the typical one, with or without the headache, um, migraine with brainstem aura, the hemiplegic migraine, as well as a retinal migraine. So before I can go into the hemiplegic migraine, I'm going to explain what the aura is, um, as well as the phases of a migraine with aura. First, there's the prodrome, which is kind of like your warning sign that something's going to happen. Um, this is usually where there's mood changes, muscle stiffness, fatigue, yawning, as well as the light and the sound sensitivity. Um, then there's the aura, and this is where you usually get the visual disturbances, like the little flashing lights, zigzags, um, sometimes some tingling on one side of the body, as well as speech and language difficulties. Then there's the headache, which is the severe unilateral or bilateral head pain. And then the postrum, which is this migraine hangover. And it has this lowered mood and feelings of well-being, um, fatigue, poor concentration and comprehension, as well as lowered intellect levels. It's really hard to think during this time. <laughs> So now I'm going to focus on my type of migraine, which is the hemiplegic migraine. And this is a very rare subtype of migraine with aura with additional severe symptoms. And when you first look at this list, it's a little bit overwhelming as well as kind of scary. Um, there's prolonged hemiparesis, which is unilateral muscle weakness, paralysis, ataxia, impaired or complete loss of consciousness going from drowsiness to coma, um, confusion, decreased cognitive abilities, dysarthria and dysphagia, which are speech difficulties, nystagmus, which is the, uh, the muscles in the eyes going back and forth very rapidly, and in some cases, seizures. And these neurologic deficits can actually last from hours to days. Um, there's also something called acephalasia, which is the migraine without the associated head pain. So there are some instances where you can have all of these other things going on, but actually no headache. And these are most common in early adolescents, particularly in females, but the prevalence is unknown. In one study in Denmark, they found that it's estimated to be about 1 in 10,000 individuals, um, but they really don't know worldwide what this is. And there's also some overlap with migraine with brainstem aura. So there are a lot of triggers. Um, the fun part about having migraines is you really don't know which combination of these can cause a migraine. So there's the typical ones like stress, hormonal changes, sleep deprivation, um, Barometric pressure changes, so changes in weather, like if it's going from a sunny, beautiful day to all of a sudden cloudy and rainy, this is a really big one. Um, hypoxia, sensory stimuli, certain medications, allergies, and blood glucose dysregulation. For the diagnosis, um, it's very difficult to reach a diagnosis for this condition. There is clinical diagnostic criteria, and the criteria for migraine with aura have to be met, which is that whole aura phase that I was describing previously. Additionally, the aura has to include fully reversible hemiparesis, as well as fully reversible visual, sensory, and speech-language symptoms. And some of these speech-language symptoms can actually include difficulty forming words, as well as difficulty understanding and comprehending language. There's two types of hemiplegic migraine. There's familial, where at least one first degree or second degree relative has identical attacks, as well as sporadic, where there is no other people in your family that have these attacks. And the most difficult part about this is usually you don't have a diagnosis until they've excluded everything else. They usually have to rule out other classes of headaches, such as head trauma, vascular disorders, intracranial disorders, and non-cephalic infection, as well as rule out other serious conditions, such as transient ischemic attacks. For treatment, there are some medications, but a lot of these, the efficacy isn't really well known. Um, they do know that tryptans and vasoconstrictors are actually contraindicated, and that some of the other main migraine medications, such as Imitrex, can actually make it worse. The one that has like moderate success is acetazolamide, also known as Diamox, and this is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor shown over here. And individuals with um, alterations, particularly in CAC and A1A, are thought to be the most responsive. Um, but in others where this doesn't work, there are tricyclic antidepressants, uh, beta blockers, and calcium channel blockers. And unfortunately, sometimes these don't work at all, and you just kind of have to hope that the symptoms decide on their own. Other parts of this are lifestyle changes, um, such as diet modifications, um, 
like eating a more balanced diet, exercise, stress management, healthy sleep patterns, and trigger identification. So now I'm gonna get into the pathophysiology of hemiplegic migraine before I really dive into the genetics. And one of the most prevalent theories right now is cortical spreading depression. And this is a slowly propagating wave of depolarization in neuronal and glial cell membranes followed by inhibition of cortical activity. And if you look at this little depiction over here, this is kind of how it all happens. It just starts in the back of the brain and just slowly moves forward. And this is also associated with a wave of hyperemia, which is vasodilation, followed by prolonged oligemia, or vasoconstriction. And what happens during this time is there's an accumulation of potassium extracellularly, and it leads to further depolarization. And this is gonna keep causing hyperexcitability. And eventually this causes disruption of the cell membrane ionic gradients, influx of sodium and calcium, and the release of glutamate. At the same time, it's also thought that there's a lot of neurogenic inflammation going on, and I won't get into these as much today, um, but it's thought that there's induction expression of COX-2 and activation of NF-kappa-beta, as well as release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as TNF-alpha, interleukin-1-beta, interleukin-6, neuroinflammatory peptides, and calcitonin gene-related peptide. And the whole point of this is that together with the wave of depolarization and the neurogenic inflammation, is that there's activation of the trigeminovascular pathway, which leads to the headache. And how this is directly implicated in hemiplegic migraine, they're really not too sure yet, um, but this is the most reliable theory so far. So now I'll get into the genetics of FHM. Um, the slide is a little bit overwhelming, but I think it's helpful to kind of see it all in one place. There are currently four genes that are well understood in FHM. Um, there's CACNA1A, ATP1A2, SCN1A, and PRRT2. And depending on which gene is mutated, there's actually different phenotypes, but they all kind of overlap. Um, CACNA1A is most associated with FHM1, ATP1A2 with FHM2, SCN1A with FHM3, and it's not really known which one that PRRT2 is involved in. All of these have autosomal dominant inheritance, but they do have reduced penetrance, except for SCN1A. I believe this is the one that's 100% penetrant with pathogenic alterations. And if you look at a lot of these, they're actually implicated in many other conditions. Um, the first is with like different types of epilepsy, as well as episodic ataxia and spinal cerebellar ataxia. The second with alternating hemiplegia of childhood. Um, the third with generalized epilepsy with febrile seizures plus, Dravet syndrome and febrile seizures. And the last with episodic kinesogenic dyskinesia, benign familial infantile seizures, and infantile convulsions and paroxysmal chorioacetosis. So the first one, CAC and A1A, is the most understood of all of them. And this codes for the pore forming alpha-1 subunit of neuronal calcium PQ voltage-gated calcium channels. And these are located on the presynaptic terminal of excitatory and inhibitory interneurons. So if you look over here, this is the excitatory neuron, and they're sitting just right over here as well as an inhibitory interneuron. They're just right over here. There's currently about 30 missense mutations identified that can lead to FHM, as well as large-scale deletions, a five prime, or a five base pair deletion in the five end promoter. And the penetrance of these is about 67 to 89%. Um, the paper that I got this from is just collecting data from different ones, so the actual penetrance varies depending on the study. And it's thought that this leads to a gain of function effect with enhanced calcium influx through the channels and increased glutamate release into the synaptic cleft over here. Um, additionally, there's increased channel open probability and channel activation at lower voltages and a reduced threshold for CSC with disrupted cortical neurotransmission balance, um, as well as increased probability of glutamate release. And this is really bad because in cortical spreading depression, there's already a lot of potassium and glutamate being released in the extracellular space. So it actually just causes this excitotoxicity effect. These are some of the missense mutations right here. Um, 
depending on the variant, there are different phenotypes. So some you only have the hemiplegic attack, but others there's unconsciousness, ataxia, nystagmus, um, as well as stupor and progressive ataxia. And what's really interesting with this last one over here is it was actually found in a family with individuals that had both FHM and spinocerebellar ataxia. And it's thought that this replaces um, a polar positively charged arginine with a neutral glutamine, increasing the hydrophobicity and reducing polarity in the voltage sensing segment, which causes a shift in activation and inactivation voltage dependence to more negative potentials, leading to the hyperpolarization shift, increasing intracellular calcium, and that excitotoxicity effect that I already mentioned. So there's going to be a lot of um, release of glutamate into the synapses. The next gene, ATP1A2, codes for the catalytic alpha-2 subunit of glial and neuronal uh, sodium potassium pumps. There are 60 or so missense mutations, small deletions, truncating frame shifts, and soft code on mutations. The penetration is about the same as CACNA1A at 63 to 87%. And it's thought that this one is actually a loss of function effect. Um, probably inducing the impaired glial reuptake of potassium and glutamate from the synaptic cleft, as well as slow recovery from excitation. So these sit over here. Um, and when these aren't working properly, you're going to get a lot of the extracellular potassium just staying in that cleft. Here are also a couple pathogenic variants um, that can also add seizures, coma, fever, and intellectual disability to the phenotype. The last one, SCN1A, codes for the poor forming alpha-1 subunit of neuronal um, sodium voltage gated channels, and they're expressed on the inhibitory interneurons over here. And there's only about eight missense mutations that are known for this one, but the penetrance is at 100%. And there's a couple of different mechanisms. Um, one is gain of function, where they think that there's an increased non-inactivated persistent sodium current induced by depolarization. Um, delayed inactivation, accelerated recovery from inactivation, and then also a loss of function effect, where there's network hyperexcitability due to reduced action potential firing from the inhibitory GABAergic interneurons. And overall, this also leads to increased glutamate and potassium in the synaptic cleft and leaves the individual more susceptible to cortical spreading depression. So for this part, um, I'm actually going to talk about myself. And this is something for me that is very personal. I haven't really had an opportunity to share with too many people, but it is something that I think is very important to raise awareness for, um, mostly because no one really knows about it. So the symptoms for me started when I was about 14 years old. I think I was in my freshman, no, my sophomore year of high school. And there was one day I was doing homework and all of a sudden I had a splitting headache that spread across the entire back of my head. Um, Eventually, I was taken to the ER, and they gave me a dose of Vicodin that was way too much for my small size, and it actually led to more problems. And for the next, I would say, two to three weeks, I think I was in and out of the ER a couple times, as well as over the next couple months, I had gone to the ER a few times. And it was really scary because no one really knew what was going on. Um, they did all the testing. They did drug testing, alcohol testing, pregnancy testing, everything that they would normally do for someone going into the ER at my age. But everything came back negative. Um, there, were MR, there were CT scans, lumbar punctures, everything. And eventually it got to the point where I would become paralyzed on one or both sides of my body and even go unconscious in some cases. And at 15 years old, this is a very scary experience, especially when people are telling you that it's probably conversion disorder. So now it's a psychiatric issue, not so much a medical one. Um, but I knew that that wasn't the case. And my family was very adamant that wasn't the case either. And eventually the symptoms, they still clustered a lot. I could have up to probably two to three of these episodes per day where I was going unconscious for up to an hour at a time. And it was very difficult because I also had to leave school at the time. Um, and actually do schooling online. And what I did was have migraines in the morning typically, and then 
during the afternoon and the evening, once I recovered, I would work on my schoolwork. And today, a lot of these migraines have kind of subsided. I had a recent flare-up for a couple of months where I, I was having these maybe three or four times a week, but they're much more manageable now. Um, and typically it starts where on one side of my body, I'll feel like a tingling sensation, usually starting in like the arm or the hand, and it just slowly spreads up my body, eventually reaching my face. And that's when I know that I have about half an hour until I have to be able to get somewhere to lay down. Also during this time, I can have other symptoms such as a brain fog kind of feeling where it's really difficult to focus and think. Um, also, I can have a lot of like sinus inflammation where it almost looks like an allergy attack, but it's not. And also like weakness is a big one. Um, muscle spasms, headache, sensitivity to light, basically everything on that list from before. And to get to this um, diagnosis of a hemiplegic migraine, it actually took a very long time. I believe it was about, I want to say six months before we found a physician who actually knew what this was. Um, in the ER, they eventually ruled it a complicated migraine, but they really had nothing that they could do to help me. Um, I saw a lot of different pediatric neurologists in Orange County, but it was the same thing. All they had for me was that it was an atypical or a complicated migraine. And there were a few that believed it was still psychological, and I was actually evaluated multiple times by psychologists in the hospital, and every time they said that I was fine, that I was normal. Um, and it was also during the time that I had multiple EEGs and MRI, and everything came back clear. And then a few months later, we were actually referred to a neurologist up in Santa Monica, and he specializes in rare migraine disorders. And he was the one that told me that it was something that was real. Um, it wasn't something that I was making up, like conversion disorder or anything like that. And he was the one that actually was able to help me get back on track so I could return to school and basically lead a normal life. And what's actually really interesting is recently I was able to have exome sequencing here at Amory performed. And I was really, really hoping to have some kind of positive results just so I could kind of figure out like, why is it that my brain isn't working? I was really hoping for one of those ion channels possibly to be mutated. But unfortunately it was negative, um, which is a little disappointing, but it's also a good thing because now I know that most likely this can be passed on. But what was really difficult is in trying to figure all of this out, I didn't really have anybody in my family that has the same condition. We think that my grandmother possibly had something very similar, um, but unfortunately she passed away before we could figure it out. So we don't really know if this is familial or if it's more sporadic. And there are a lot of triggers for me. Usually it's not just one trigger, it's actually multiple ones. Um, the biggest ones are usually shifts in the weather as well as sleep deprivation. Um, if my blood sugar gets a little bit out of control, because I do have hypoglycemia, allergies, um, stress, all of those things can kind of lead to it. For me personally, for treatment, um, I've been the most responsive to azelamide, and it, for the most part, it helps. Um, unfortunately, it cannot stop a full attack, but it will prevent it from progressing to the most severe symptoms, which is usually unconsciousness at that point. Um, I also take over-the-counter pain medications and a few supplements to kind of help. But other than that, there really isn't any other treatment that can help me. For management, I really had to change my life um, and shape it around this. For the most part, I can lead a pretty normal life. Um, I do have to be careful about what I'm eating, what I'm drinking. Um, I'm very active to make sure that I can stay healthy. And it does affect my quality of life as well. Um, I do have to make sure that no matter what I do, there is always that thought in the back of the mind, in my mind that a migraine could happen. And I do have to be aware of if a migraine were to happen, how can I get myself to safety? And for the most part, I have a lot of friends and family that are very aware of my condition and can help me out when I need it. But there have been times where it is difficult both mentally and emotionally to have this condition. Um, as an adolescent dealing with it, I 
definitely struggled with depression and anxiety and all of those things. And I think it's really important to always be very open about that only because I think a lot of times people are kind of afraid to admit to those things and afraid to reach out for help. But I think it's, for me, it was the easiest to be able to talk to people about the condition and how I was feeling about it before I could really get better. Um, the hardest part was definitely my education. I did have to do online schooling for all of my high school career, but I was able to graduate early and eventually go on to UCLA. And from there is where I really became fascinated with the brain. And I ended up graduating in neuroscience. And my goal is always to understand my condition at the molecular level. I want to know exactly what's happening in my brain, as well as not only how my brain works, but why is it not working. And moving forward, um, I do want to be a physician, and I do want to help other, or other children and adolescents with rare conditions. Working here at Ambry has really exposed me to the world of medical genetics, and I'm fascinated by it, and it's something that I want to continue to pursue. Um, so I really hope to actually get into medical school next year. I'm in the process of applying right now. And that's it. Thank you very much, Kirsten. That was really fascinating. I think I learned a lot. Um, from your talk today. Um, as a reminder to anyone who has questions, please uh, type them in the in the bar to the right and we will answer them. If for some reason we don't get your questions today, if you have any, you can feel free to email us and we will um, get an answer to you. Um, we have a question right now um, from someone who also has a migraine with aura and she was wondering um, if you get them as well and if you could describe your experience and if you go through any kind of progression. So for me, my main aura is definitely the loss of sensation. Um, it usually starts unilaterally, either in my hand or my arm, and sometimes actually in my leg as well. And the side that's hit the most is usually the left side, and it's just kind of this progression of starting from the bottom up. And as soon as it starts to get worse, usually after a few minutes, is when I start to feel it more in my head, and I start to get that really like that lethargic feeling, very fatigued. Um, it becomes harder to articulate words. There's actually been times where I completely lose the ability to speak. Um, and I usually have to try and communicate either by like writing things down or sometimes because my mom knows me so well, she can say like blink once for yes, blink twice for no, something like that. Um, other things that I get sometimes are like the little spots in my eyes um, where it gets difficult to see. And um, what's another one? Yeah, usually the weakness is the other one where it gets very difficult to walk. Like I'll actually have to sit down because I can't bear any weight on whatever side is affected by the aura. I'm gonna leave another minute or so for questions. I guess I have a question myself. Um, from your experience, have you met other people who have the same condition and is their experience and what they um, go through similar to, to yours, um, not only with, with diagnosis, but also with the, the symptoms that they have and, and how much it affects their quality of life and what they're able to do? I have actually never met somebody with this condition before. Um, I'm really hoping eventually to meet somebody that has it. So if anybody watching does have it, please feel free to reach out. Um, but in my experience, having this can be very isolating, mostly because the people who do have it don't really know how many other people have it and they don't really speak out about it. Um, and in doing this, I'm really hoping to kind of raise more awareness for it. Um, but I do know that other people that have it, unfortunately, they have not had the same success that I've been able to have in treatment and management. I did have one professor, um, at UCLA who had patients with this, who her patients did not have the same quality of life. They were struggling a little bit more. Um, but I definitely think it's a very personal condition and it varies a lot patient to patient.
Okay, that looks like that's it for questions. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. As a reminder, again, the um, the questionnaire will, will pop up when you exit the session. Kirsten, thank you so much for your interesting talk today. I know I learned a lot, and I'm sure everyone else did also. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to, to email us at Educate Next, and we can um, make sure that she answers your questions. And as a reminder, our next Educate Next webinar is on June 4th.